When we're tested, it shows what's really in us. Not what we think is in us, but what's really, really in us. Any of you going through some tough stuff right now? Any of you been through some stuff that's kind of over, but you still don't really understand it? You're like, what in the world was that? <laughs> Amen? Well, we have to learn in our life that there are tests. Some of them God allows or permits. Some of them He even arranges. <laughs> you say, well, what do you mean by that? I'll give you an example. I'm going to kind of change the facts about this just a little bit because I don't want the people involved to hear it and think I'm telling their tales on TV, so I'll change it enough for you to get the point. There were two girls that were nurses and they got into an altercation, fairly serious one, and one girl left to go do something else and nothing was ever resolved between them. Now, you know, ignoring things never is a solution. How many of you know that? And even though you can go away and, you know, think, well, I'm just not going to be mad. I'll forget it. You know, there's still things eating at you if there's no closure or res resolution brought to the thing. So about a year passed, and there was a special class that was being given for nurses in a specified field. And there probably are thousands of those kinds of nurses in the U.S., but this class was only for 10 women, 10 female nurses, and there were going to be five groups of two. Now, 10 out of all the United States, and guess who shows up there? Those two women. Well, the last thing in the world they wanted to do was be trapped in a room for three days with each other. And then to make it even worse, they paired them in partners and groups of two for a lot of stuff that had to be done that weekend, and who do you think was together? <laughs> well, it was like so majorly uncomfortable till finally one of them said, okay, look, we can't just keep smiling and pretending like nothing's going on. We have to talk. So the next day they had lunch and they talked and it made things just so much better. Now, I believe that God arranges things like that. Sometimes He will put us in a position where we have no choice at all except to face an issue in our lives. And you may think initially it's a crisis, but really it's God bringing you to a point where you have no choice but to face something that's going to destroy you if you let it stay. Amen? Now. There's also many things the devil does, and a matter of fact, even, and I just want you to hear this right, because I'm going to balance it all out. God is good, the devil's bad, but there are things that even Satan does that God doesn't deliver you from right away, because he's going to use it to bring you to a higher level. He only has good in mind, and what He wants you to do during that thing is trust Him. God does test us, but He never tempts us. He never tempts us to sin. Now, when we're going through real difficulties, which everybody does go through them at some time or other in their life, some of you may be in some now, some of you maybe have just come out of one. Somebody may be heading to warn one that you don't even know is coming up yet. And I know that a lot of you are maybe kind of thinking, well, gee, I hope, thought you, maybe you could tell me something that would help me avoid all that. Well, you know, there is no message like that because the Bible says in the world you will have tribulation. Cheer up. I've overcome the world. So, but when we're, when we're, when we're in these tough times, what we believe is tested. Can I tell you something? You, you have no idea what you believe until it's tested. You may think you know what you believe, 
But you have no idea what you believe until it's tested. You have no idea how strong you really are or how much faith you really have. And the only way, how many of you would like to have great faith? Well, the only way your faith is going to grow is if God puts you in a place where you have to use it. And when you use your faith, that normally means that you're just going like, God, I don't feel you. I can't hear you. I don't understand this. It hurts. And in the midst of that, somehow you make a decision that you're either going to go under or go over with God. There can be some very difficult things that happen in our lives, and it's amazing what we think we will do or won't do until we're faced with a situation. I used to work with a woman many years ago that had another friend whose husband got into an affair, and this woman made the decision to stay with her husband and try to work things out. Well, my friend said, there is no way that I would ever do that. If my husband ever did that, if he ever got involved with another woman, that's it. I would be out of here. There would be no way that I would do that. No way, no way, no way, no way, no way. Have any of you ever said there is no way that I would ever do that? About something, you know. Well, a few years went by and lo and behold, her husband's an elder in the church and he's helping a woman whose husband had died repair some things in her house, got into some counseling, got into some comfort. The comfort went too far got into a full-blown affair with her. This lasted for a period of time, and the woman found it out. Well, she decided to stay with her husband <laughs> and try to work things out. And I'll never forget that because I remember so her just going on and on and on about how she would never, she would never. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is how many times we say, I would never do that. Or we're judging somebody who's maybe made a mistake. I would never do that. Can you believe they did that? I would never do that. And the truth is, is you, nobody really, nobody really knows what they would do. <laughs> in any situation, until you're in that situation. So just don't be so full of yourself and think that you've just got it all figured out. You say, well, now that scares me because there's some things that, man, if God put me in that situation, I just, I'm so afraid that I would backslide or fall into sin. Well, first of all, God never allows more to come on you than what you can bear if you trust Him. Now, I want to tell you, when you get in trouble, the first thing you better do is trust God. Because if you try to do it on your own, you are liable to get in trouble. What are some of the things that, some of the temptations that we could have if we're going through something really, really, really tough? Well, first of all, if you've had old habits, old addictions, if you get under a real serious trial, especially if you've not been free from that thing for a long time, then you may be tempted. Like I remember even after I quit smoking, which has been 30 some odd years ago, people who smoke know his, you know, habitually that when you get nervous or you get upset or there's pressure, the first thing you want to grab for is a cigarette. Some people do that with food. You know, people do a lot of different things. People who, who drink excessively will do that. People who take drugs, anytime there's pressure, they take drugs to relieve that. So I can remember that when I would get upset, the first thing I would want, this was just like in the first few months when I was still really trying to break that habit. The minute that I would feel pressured, I'd think, I'm going to get some cigarettes and I'm going to smoke them. <laughs> like, who am I hurting but myself? You know? I mean, how dumb is that? Like, it's ridiculous. But sometimes if you're, you're having a trial, you might be tempted to go back to something that you've been set free from. And the Bible says, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. And do not be ensnared again in a yoke of bondage, which you have once put off. So the minute, when you're in a trial, the minute you begin to feel that temptation to go back to old things. When, when the Israelites were out in the wilderness, every time things got tough, they want to go back to Egypt. 
go back to Egypt. Well, you know, when they were in Egypt, they were begging God to get them out of Egypt. So why go back there? Why go back to something that was tormenting you and killing you that you begged God to get you out of, and so now he's gotten you out of it, and so now you're having a little bit of trouble, and the first thing the devil whispers in your ears, well, this ain't changed. This is not, this is not doing any good. You were having more fun in Egypt. That's what the Israelites thought. I mean, we're out here starving in the wilderness. At least we had onions and leeks back in Egypt. Doesn't sound like, oh, and garlic. That doesn't sound like a very good diet to me. Sometimes you're tempted to get angry at God. Do you know that that is a temptation from Satan? When you're in a trial that you get angry at God and begin to blame him. Sometimes you can begin to resent people that don't have the problems you have. Or you can begin to resent people that have the blessings that you want. How many of you have noticed when you're in trouble, when things are tough, you are very tempted to complain? Three people, this is a great group. <laughs> I've either got the holiest people in the world out here tonight or you're all extremely tired. How many of you have noticed when you are having problems that you are tempted to complain? Yeah. All right. Well, I can tell you that I believe that God wants us to totally get over complaining. Now, I don't know how many times we're going to have to go around the mountain to get that lesson, but I think that complaining is a respectable sin. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? It's one that we allow. It stinks in the nostrils of God, but in Christian circles, it's one that it's like no big deal. But it is a big deal to God, and we need to start looking at it in a totally different way. I think that unforgiveness is like that. I think it's something that we put up with. It's kind of become like one of those things. It's like, well, yeah, we know it's wrong, but, and it causes more problems. That one thing opens more doors in Christians' lives for Satan to bring ruin than any other single thing. Sometimes when we have problems, we become indignant. Well, why is this happening to me? I don't understand why this is happening to me. And you know, the thing that I think is amazing about that is we don't have that attitude when it happens to somebody else. It's like, well, now, brother, you just need to trust God and press through this. And... Come on now. Oh, but when it happens to us, it's like, I cannot believe why is this happening to me? Well, why not you? <laughs> why is it always okay for somebody else, but it's never okay for us? So what I want you to do from now on, when any trouble comes your way, or you know somebody who's having a problem, the first thing I want you to think and say is, I'm not going to panic. This is only a test. <laughs> Amen? Let's practice, say, don't panic. don't panic. This is only a test. Because the truth of the matter is, this too will pass. Amen? The test will pass, and hopefully you will pass it. <laughs> but if you don't, you will get to retake it. I mean, I can tell you that once I found that out, it made me a lot more made me obedient a lot quicker because I really finally discovered, you know, I've been doing this a long time and after 30 years you learn a few things. And I've discovered that God won't change his mind. When he decides something's going to be a certain way, then it's either going to be that way or we will be miserable. Those are the only two choices. And so it's just much better off to get into agreement with God really quick and stop just going around and around and around the same stupid mountains over and over and over. Some of you have got a rut at the base of your mountain. <laughs> and it is time now to move on. Amen? Somebody give God praise. Another thing we're tempted to do is take matters into our own hands. <laughs> Well, I'm just not going to put up with this anymore, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do something else. And that's the worst thing that you can do, because if you've already got a problem, now you give birth to an Ishmael, you're going to have another problem. 
You know what I mean by that? Abraham was promised a child and he got tired of waiting on God's promise so he got a bright idea with his wife and he got another woman pregnant. How, that, how his wife could have suggested that is beyond me, but I guess sometimes when you want something bad enough you can do some pretty goofy things. And uh, then it just really put off God's promise that much longer. And so the last thing you want to do is get into works of the flesh. You want to just keep saying, God, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. Now, James chapter 1, 12 through 14, this will be the foundational scripture for this entire series. And I probably will read it at the beginning of each one of these lessons. You know, being a teacher, I really love to teach a series on something. Because I honestly don't think we get it in one hour, or two, or three, or even four. <laughs> but at least it gives me a chance to come at it from a lot of different angles. James 1, 12 through 14. Blessed, happy, and to be envied is the man who is, uh-oh, patient <laughs> under not when it's over, under trial. We'll talk about patience a little bit more in a minute. And who stands up, not lays down and gets depressed, discouraged, in despair and gives up. Who stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted from God. For God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he's drawn away, enticed, and baited by his own evil desire, lust, and passions. Now, Some of this may be a little bit hard for you to swallow, but sooner or later you're going to have to hear it, so I've just chosen to be the one to teach it to you. Because, <laughs> you know, a good mama not only gives her babies dessert and smashed up peaches and bananas, but you throw in some vegetables and that nasty smashed up spinach and carrots and the zucchinis and all that stuff. And I know how to do this, so there's no point in you fighting me. <laughs> God showed me this as an example one time, because you know, I, I preach a real straightforward, in some ways, not hard in the wrong way, but my ministry is definitely not a dessert ministry. <laughs> but. <laughs> The thing is, is you, you can't be healthy on just dessert. And I think it's great to get that encouraging word, that word of prophecy that tells you you're going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread and, you know, on and on and on. But, you know, I mean, you, you can get some great prophecy about all the great things you're going to do, but if somebody don't come along and spank your bottom and make you grow up, <laughs> then it'll just be empty words spoken over an empty head and nothing will ever happen. He who has stood the test will receive the reward and the crown of life. You're going to see later as we go through this weekend, one of the things I'm going to teach on is the faithfulness test. And the Bible says that faithful people get promoted. Not people who quit and give up and change their mind every three weeks and won't be loyal to anything and won't keep their commitments, but faithful people who keep on keeping on and keep on keeping on and keep on keeping on and keep on keeping on. And we're even going to talk about the forgiveness test because there's no way that you're ever going to be what God wants you to be and have what God wants you to have if you're going to have bitterness in your heart. We're going to talk about the Judas kiss test. You're like, I don't know if I'm coming back or not. 
We're going to talk about the security test, how God has to get the insecurities out of us to where we're not blown out of the water because somebody rejects us or criticizes us or doesn't like what we're doing. But I know how to cheer you up, make you laugh a little bit, and beat you up at the same time. <laughs> the Word of God is a hammer, a knife. <laughs> and I remember, God put this in my heart one time, I remember when my babies were little and they loved peaches and bananas, and so we'd start with that and, you know, put in the peaches, put in the bananas, and then... Uh, <laughs> and so then I'd slide in some of that awful stuff, and they go... Pfft, pfft. But I remember, how many of you remember your mom was running all down their face? Well, you get good with that spoon and you just scrape it back up, <laughs> shove it right back in there. Amen? I've even got, I've even got my, my puppy dog, she, I have to give her some stuff that she don't like either. And man, she'll like, you know, <coughs> act like it's killing her. And I'm just like, Dutchie, she might as well stop that because you're going to take it one way or the other. And so I just want to tell you guys straight up, I'm a good mama, I know how to feed my kids, and you will eat this, so you might as well start chewing it and swallowing it. <laughs> so here's what, here's what you have to understand about this scripture. How in the world could these things be good for us? How could this pain be good? How can this hard thing be good? How can this waiting be good? How can putting up with this obnoxious person be good? How could it possibly be good if I didn't get the promotion I deserved at work and somebody who doesn't deserve it at all got it? You just tell me, God, how that can be good. I'll tell you why. Because when we're tested, it shows what's really in us. Not what we think is in us, but what's really, really in us. Let's look at James 1, verse 1. We'll just start with verse 2. Consider it wholly joyful, my brethren, whenever you're enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort. Count it wholly joyful. <laughs> when you get into any kind of a trial, be assured and understand that the trial and the proving of your faith brings out endurance and steadfastness and patience. That sounds lovely, doesn't it? But you know what I found out? It brought a whole lot of stuff out of me before we got around to that. <laughs> now, I am patient now under trial. I endure. I'm steadfast. Pretty much, I don't act very different when I'm in trials and when I'm not now. And that's the way God wants us to be. But it took a lot of trips around the mountain and a lot of trips out to the woodshed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I heard one girl say, say the other day, man, I got busted by God. <laughs> well, <laughs> but see, here's the whole point. When God does that, you know what it means? That he loves you. It means that He loves you. Some of you say, I've had about all the love I can take for a while. Well, James 1.12 says, Blessed, happy, and to be envied is the man who is patient under trial and stands up under temptation. For when he has stood the test and been approved, he will receive the victor's crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. As we're talking about today, many things in life, it's just a test that we need to pass. We need to be much more concerned about our behavior, our reaction to what's happening, than we are what's actually happening.
women in Albania are taught to be silent and not to speak out. This is something that has come from long past ago and although many organizations uh, do advocate and do encourage women to bring it out and to um, tell the truth, it's something that has to do with the culture. If something happens to you, it's a shame factor. For some women, the Christian church is becoming a refuge, a place where they can speak freely. However, less than 2% of the population are Christian, and most of them have no spiritual mothers or fathers. What I'm facing, I cannot share with my parents. They are not Christians. What I'm facing, I cannot, I do not have an adult Christian to talk to and say, is this normal, what is happening to me? Or how can I face this difficulty? Counsel is something that we lack. The first generation has just to experience everything, good or bad. And this spiritual mother for people, it's for, for the ladies and for the women, it's very important because it's somebody saying, I've gone through this way. It's painful, but you're gonna make it. And this is what Joyce has been transmitting to us and giving us power to go forward even though there are hard times in our life, even though not everything is perfect, but we know that somebody else went through the same road, the same pain, and she made it. So we're gonna make it as well. I read her book, Battlefield of the Mind, in prison. My stepfather, he was an abusive man towards me. I used him as an excuse for years to do drugs. I would play it out in my mind like, if everybody knew my pain I was feeling, they would, they would understand why I was doing it. But I had to forgive him, and I did that in prison after reading Battlefield of the Mind, and that's what released me. Je kunt dit boek bestellen via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of telefonisch 026 20 22 100. Een dag begint pas goed met een goed ontbijt. En een dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce. Nieuwe impulsen en bemoedigende gedachten die je zullen sterken tijdens je dag. Abonneer je gratis op de overdenkingen op joyce-meyer.nl slash overdenking of op Facebook. Begin je dag goed. Het is het waard.